Good afternoon and welcome to the RespectAbility webinar for July 10, 2019. My name is Philip Khan Polly. I am the Policy and Practices Director here at RespectAbility, and today we're talking about the Promise Program, specifically the lessons learned from Maryland's experience with the Promise Program, and I am so delighted to be here with you today. Um, just a little background in terms of what is Promise and why it's important and what real lessons it offers for all of us who are working towards the goal of improving employment outcomes for youth with disabilities. So <clears throat> back in 2013, RespectAbility was founded, um, really dedicated to the core mission of fighting stigmas and advancing opportunities. Uh, and as part of that, one of the key things that I do as the Policy and Practices Director is really looking at promising practices and public policies that are intended to support power and support, empower, and really train youth with disabilities to succeed, to you know, present competitive workforce strategies to help people really make the use of uh, limited resources, and that is really what the PROMISE program is all about. So the PROMISE program was a grant program that came out of the Department of Education several years ago. Um, it was distributed to several different states, and Jade's going to talk about her experiences you know, running the PROMISE grant in Maryland and what, it, uh, what lessons it has to offer for all other programs that are serving uh, low-income youth, youth with disabilities, youth that have serious barriers to employment. Uh, and I can say that the Promise is one of the most interesting efforts to really get at that key challenge of helping people with disabilities, but more importantly, helping youth, and not just helping youth, but also engaging families as a key part of a workforce development strategy. And as a result of that, it is a really impressive um, program, and it achieved some really very interesting and very valuable things in, a variety, in everywhere from Maryland to California, where in our past work um, in Long Beach, we actually saw the direct impact of the Promise program and what it was doing for you know some very hard hit. So I'm delighted to be joined today by Jade Gingrich, who is the Director of Employment Policy at the Maryland Department of Disabilities, MDOD. So Gingrich has been a critical leader with um, the department since 2004. Prior to that, she was the executive. Director of the Governor's Committee on Employment for People with Disabilities. Um, she is an experts expert with an MSc in special ed with specialization in transitions from Johns Hopkins. Um, and she went to uh, as an undergrad um, at Wheeling University. Um, I had the pleasure of recently seeing Jade present these um, slides at a meeting of the CCD Employment and Training Task Force. And so I know you're in for a really great learning opportunity here today. So Jade, it's all yours. Great. Thank you so very much, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to share Marilyn's experiences on uh, Promise. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, you know while there were other sites, um, we found a lot of commonality around our lessons learned. Um, some some are unique to each of the sites, um, in part because of the unique nature of uh, existing state services and programmatic. But but there are a lot of themes that are consistent across all of the sites. So so while I'm presenting that Maryland lens. You know, many of these are thematic things that that are um, national um, lessons learned. But um, first, a little bit of background. Um, I am with the Maryland Department of Disabilities, um, and the Maryland Department of Disabilities um, was created by then Governor Ehrlich, and it was the um, first uh, cabinet level department in the country um, dedicated to uh, individuals with disabilities. And um, it's important to note that we um, are focused on all disabilities. So this runs the gamut of um, disabilities. Some, some states have very topical or specific disability focuses, but MDOD is really focused across the broad spectrum of um, Marylanders with disabilities. And we are um, working to ensure that they um, that we coordinate and improve the delivery of services to individuals with disabilities. Um, we also have a strong emphasis on independence and living in the community. Um, employment, of course, is a core cornerstone of all the work that we do. Um, so it was a natural fit for me to uh, support uh, the Maryland Promise Grant um, as it relates uh, to um, transition to youth and improving their educational employment outcome. We do have a Maryland Commission on Disabilities, and our tagline is Changing Maryland for the Better by Promoting Equality of Opportunity, Access, and Choice for Marylanders with Disabilities. So uh, some of our broader uh, employment activities under the uh, umbrella of the Department of Disabilities, we collaborate particularly with um, our uh, state-level Department of Labor, 
our Developmental Disabilities Administration, our De um, Division of Rehabilitation Services, our State Department of Education, our Behavioral Health Administration, as well as others as it relates to employment efforts because there's a broad array of uh, programming and it's actually scattered across a, a wide array of different departments. And so one of the things that we do is to work to try and build um, that interagency coordination and collaboration among those partners. Some of our more recent um, accomplishments include a Disability Employment Awareness Month Executive Order that was issued by uh, Governor Larry Hogan, implementation of a state hiring preference, um, the Maryland Equal Employment Opportunity Act, and that um, made Maryland the second state in the country to eliminate a subminimum wage. We're in a phase out phase um, and are actually ahead of schedule um, in terms of those efforts. Um, Maryland Promise, which I will be talking more about, um, as well as Employment First. Um, we have a uh, technical assistance grant through uh, the National Technical uh, Transition Assistance Center, um, and that is helping us uh, particularly around interagency coordination and collaboration as it relates to transition. Um, Maryland had a disability employment initiative uh, with the Department of Labor and two local America job centers, um, workplace learning, and more. So I believe I touched on these briefly, um, but you know, October, of course, is uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month, and we plan a number of activities to highlight um, those uh, the successes and the benefits of hiring. Um, I talked about the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, um, and uh, we have co-leadership with that from our advocacy group, People on the Go. Um, then information on our state hiring preference, so a credit of five points is added for an applicant with a disability as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and then Maryland Promise. So the purpose of Promise um, was six grants were awarded in fiscal year 2013 for five years. We're actually heading into our second no-cost extension year. Um, with the no-cost extensions being dedicated to uh, research and dissemination. Um, but the five years were to implement model demonstration projects that promoted um, outcomes for youth on SSI and their families uh, with a focus on educational unemployment outcomes. And it was really designed to encourage new ways of providing support and to, to build upon an evidence base um, as it relates to some of the core interventions that I'll talk about um, to, to really start to be able to hone our, our focus on what are the, the strategies or the practices that research shows um, can make a difference in these outcomes. Um, so it's really uh, a really innovative, critical, and pretty large um, undertaking. So the context, um, this is some of the research in the background. There were national youth transition demonstrations that were uh, conducted by the Social Security Administration. Um, there's also research from the Center on Transition to Employment for Youth with Disabilities. And then um, the Maryland Seamless Transition Collaborative, which was an undertaking several years ago um, here in Maryland uh, that really helped to facilitate the local level creation of uh, transition uh, groups that work together to, to bridge the divide. But there's still a whole lot more work to do. While we have some research that tells us that um, we know some of the things that work, certainly additional research um, in these areas is needed. So the Promise sites. So New York Promise um, served several locations, particularly in upstate New York and New York City. Arkansas had several um, targeted areas across their state. Uh, Maryland Promise was a statewide effort. Wisconsin Promise was also a statewide effort. Aspire was a collaboration. Um, it was actually six different sites under one um, uh, leadership uh, led by Utah. And the six uh, states that were involved with uh, Aspire were Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, Colorado, and Arizona. And um, as great as the challenges are, you know, working at the state level, trying to get six different governors to sign off, um, working within six different systems, um, Aspire was a pretty impressive undertaking. Aspire also had to um, work with a lot of tribal units, which have a very separate governing because of the Native Americans and so forth. Um, so Aspire had some really, really interesting lessons learned, um, particularly around working with um, tribal governments. Um, as well as that, that cross-state uh, coordination. And then, of course, as Philip referenced, California Promise. 
um, that again worked in several sites um, across California. So the research design. Our target population were youth between the ages of 14 and 16 who were enrolled in SSI um, and their families. And we were required to recruit across the six sites 13,172 participants for the study. Each of the sites had to recruit at least 2,000, except California. California had a larger uh, number to draw from, um, and they requested um, a, higher, a higher number. Um, and we all met or exceeded our enrollment targets. And that in and of itself was a pretty impressive um, feat. Um, but part of the reason why this was so large scale is because by being able to have 2,000 um, individuals or more, um, they, they were then randomly assigned into treatment or control. And it's considered amongst researchers the gold standard, that the findings as a result of this, because the size of the, the, the pools were so large, um, are really going to be um, have a, a level of credibility and substance behind them. Um, and it's important to note that Social Security Administration actually provided the sites with the contact information of the youth that were on SSI. Um, so each of the sites had to come up with their own recruitment strategies in order to accomplish um, that process. And again, the intervention group then received the enhanced services, and then the group that were randomly assigned to the control group received the existing services that they would have, you know, absent promise. Um, and that allows for some comparison and contrast as they look long term at the outcomes. So this was a, a cross partner initiative at the federal level, um, which also I think was a learning experience um, because I think that the federal partners had not um, previously collaborated on something to this degree. Um, but the promised partners were the U.S. Department of Education, um, and they were the funders. Um, but the funds came from um, a number of other partners as well. Um, including Health and Human Services um, and the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, and then the Social Security Administration is paying for the cost for a national longitudinal evaluation. And Mathematica is the vendor who um, has received that award from, uh, from the Social Security Administration. And we anticipate any day now, although we have not seen it yet, um, that the 18-month um, evaluation um, assessment from Mathematica will be released, um, which will certainly have um, some robust details in terms of experiences, lessons learned, certainly not going to be getting at sort of the longitudinal impact um, and so forth, because that was, again, only 18 months into the process, and that included the time that was spent um, recruiting of individuals and, and getting started on this. Um, and then there was also a TA center that was awarded to the National, oh, I'm sorry, to the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. So those were all of the key partners on Promise. So the core features, um, while each of the sites designed um, slightly different models, each of them had to have uh, consistent core features, um, first of which was cross-agency partnerships. Um, and then to provide uh, key interventions or supports and services, which included case management, benefits counseling and financial capability services, career and work-based learning experiences to include paid employment in integrated settings. All of the youth were to have at least one paid employment, um, as well as parent training information um, and engagement. Um, and then we had, of course, uh, the uh, robust challenge of the outreach and recruitment um, as well as providing technical assistance, including professional development for stakeholders, particularly many of our frontline staff. So the, the problem that PROMISE was intended to address, a significant number of child SSI recipients do not become independent, self-sufficient taxpaying members of the community as adults. The families, oftentimes, of those recipients are also not self-sufficient. And anecdotally, we know that there are families, you know, and extended families that rely on the youth SSI check as their only consistent source of income on a monthly basis. So when we start to say, you know, maybe this youth could go to work, um, it does create a lot of fear and anxiety in families because of that reliance on that single source of income. Um, and then also the issue that many of the uh, child SSI recipients become adult SSI recipients, and that is due in part to their low educational attainment and employment rates, 
um, as well as their low post-secondary vocational rehabilitation or other um, enrollment rates. So that linkage to services after they exit school um, was really a key um, factor in, in this process as well. So Maryland promises intervention. We made the decision that our intervention was going to be community-based, not school-based, not facility-based. Um, and so our staff were um, equipped with laptops and a number of other uh, factors to ensure that uh, you know, confidentiality and data was, was kept safe. Um, they were equipped with uh, the technology to be able to access the internet from anywhere. Um, and they also were set the task of mapping, mapping places in the community libraries, McDonald's, um, where they could meet with and engage with families and youth. Um, and this was really a key piece. We had a few um, facility-based locations, mainly for staff meetings, um, but um, really the intent was to be meeting families and youth in the communities where they live. And that was a really key piece of the strategy around engagement, because being willing to show up in some of these neighborhoods um, and being a presence, um, I think really helped, um, A, with that assertive community engagement. Um, so we weren't waiting for them to come to us. We were proactively going out and finding them. Um, but also, it, 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 it helped demonstrate the level of commitment um, that, we, that we had to serving these families and youth and to really understanding their communities and the, and the barriers that they face within them. Um, also, making the case for work. Um, you know, helping them to understand how work was possible, what supports and services were uh, available, and the value of work. That in fact, you know, while they may perceive that financially they'd be worse off as a result of work, that in fact financially they could be better off. Um, and, uh, and helping with that, particularly that financial education piece of helping to make different choices with funding and so forth um, was a real appeal to many of our families um, who are struggling. And then, of course, that coordinated assertive case management, because these are families that spend a significant amount of in crisis and often careening from crisis to crisis, being it unstable housing, um, being able to pay utilities, um, you know, violence. Um, a number of different factors. And so, you know, often their lives are consumed with just managing crises. And so that um, assertive coordinated case management to really help resolve the crises and, and continue that focus on and movement forward um, to employment, education, and so forth was a really core aspect um, in building those relationships and that trust um, and that consistency of access and availability were really key um, strategies. So this is a difficult um, visual, but uh, to talk us through, so we had a promise interagency leadership, the Department of Disabilities, Waystation, um, who was one of our contracted vendors, and they oversaw the case managers and the family employment specialist. They are an entity with um, experience in serving particularly individuals with mental health needs, but also individuals with developmental disabilities, um, a strong history of uh, employment and benefits counseling, um, and uh, some have done some work on some national research grants as well. And then the other partner was Transcend. Um, Transcend, also well known nationally for their research and activities, and they, um, in fact, provided the technical assistance and support. Um, they oversaw the subcontract for recruitment. Westat was our recruitment partner and did a phenomenal job, um, particularly with uh, with the challenges involved in, in in a very short amount of time trying to recruit 2,000 youth. Um, and uh, then they provided the technical assistance and training to our frontline um, staff. Um, as they were deployed out into the field. And that field-based technical assistance was really, really critical. Um, you know, we did some classroom traditional style of professional development, but really the population um, and the uh, employees that we had benefited much more from that frontline, um, real-time modeling and technical assistance um, as they were going about their, their work. Um, it's also important to note that we made a conscious effort to hire staff with experience um, who were who were but who were younger um, and also who were comfortable and or um, in some instances actually came from um, the communities that we were engaging with uh, under promise and um, while it did result in 
um, additional professional development, um, I think that that experience and knowledge and what they brought to the table um, you know, uh, helped to build those relationships. Um, and I view it as a capacity building exercise because they came from different places um, and they've gone back to uh, different careers. Seeing that knowledge base and their capacity, our entire state has benefited post promise as they've gone on to their other jobs. So our intervention teams were composed of the lead case manager and the family employment specialist. The benefits counselor then was pulled in as, um, as needed or um, as interest or employment dictated. And then we interfaced with the school personnel, but we chose a, a different route. Um, we actually um, built our model around the engagement of schools being driven um, by the consent from parents um, for the staff to interact with the school personnel. Um, and I have to say that that actually helped us to really navigate some initial resistance from local schools um, who had fears and concerns um, about the model and the fact that, that we weren't asking them for data, we were you know, not requiring that they provide us access, but rather we were coming with the consent um, to, to engage with them, um, alleviated a lot of that stress and really helped to facilitate and, and build and empower those relationships. And in Maryland, um, our schools became very great partners as a result of, of that. Um, and then um, the intervention components. So we had an intake process um, with the planning process, um, development of a family plan, trying to identify some low-hanging fruit. What are one or two key issues that the family was concerned about, that the youth was interested in or concerned about, so that we could really help to, to get um, an initial positive or result early on in the process. Um, those family and youth plans were living, breathing documents, constantly evolved and changed over time um, as steps and pieces were um, completed and as the needs changed. Um, but they were really um, a cornerstone of sort of starting that inherent uh, relationship building and engagement. Um, then the positive personal profile. Um, and it's really important to note that this um, the, the term, you know, positive or, or asset or strengths-based um, was really important because I think that, that there's a lot of messaging that these youth receive um, that's about deficit um, or weakness. Um, and so really stopping to, to reflect on and to capture in writing some of their strengths and their interests and so forth um, really uh, was a positive activity. Um, that again, help them to perhaps begin to see themselves in a different light and one which then can be translated into um, employment. So based on those strengths, based on those interests, um, that helped to inform that job development plan. Um, and then include, include elements of uh, unpaid work experiences that aligned with their interests or, or strengths, um, as well as then uh, the creation of um, the unpaid work experiences and paid work. Um, and then there was the coordination of services. And we really used a model of, you know, focused on linkage to existing services. Um, and then we did have some resources available if, in fact, uh, the, the needs were not able to be met through other uh, support services and systems. Um, so we've also been able to define, at least here in Maryland, some gaps um, in terms of funding and availability. One of the big ones was driver's education. Driving, um, being able to drive is a major um, uh, piece of being able to access employment for many of these youth. Um, but the cost uh, and the requirements in Maryland, the cost of driver's education could prove a barrier and there were no existing um, potential pools of resources to fund that. And so we were able to, to fund that. Um, so that was an important piece. Also being able to acquire IDs. Um, identification is becoming more and more um, a, a requirement for um, applying for any type of job. Um, and oftentimes these youth um, and family members didn't have them. They had been lost, they removed because they're a very transient population. So even something as simple as being able to say, yes, we'll pay you know, for you to get an ID or yes, we'll pay for you to get a replacement birth certificate um, was something that actually became really substantive and meaningful in helping making certain that they had the right documents that they needed so when they went in and completed an application, um, you know, they had them as a ready, um, really helped in oft oftentimes to facilitate that employment process. Um, and then, of course, the benefits counseling and financial education. 
And the financial education piece, we had initially designed um, to be more of a, a class-based setting. Um, but what we found was that there was greater demand for that one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, and, and that highlighted a desire to say, you know, we want to figure out what we can be doing differently so we're not ending up at the same place all the time. Um, but it also was an opportunity for us to really absorb some of the, the, the hard choices that, that they have to face. Um, in one particular instance, we had a, um, uh, a mom who was sitting with the financial planner um, who was talking about um, the need to get a, a Nintendo or, or one of those games that you, you play um, at home. And the financial planner said, well, I think that that's really a want, not a need. Um, and she said, no, I need it because if he has the Nintendo and he's playing at home, I know where he is. If he doesn't have that, he's out in the street, and, and I don't know what will happen to him, and I fear for his safety. Um, and, you know, when she framed it that way, the financial planner said, you know what, that's absolutely a need. Let's make um, a change, and maybe we can come up with some money over here. Um, but I think that it also highlights that we have a tremendous amount in the disability community to learn um, to really be able to meaningfully engage um, and to understand and to then in turn be able to support effectively individuals who are living in poverty with disabilities. Um, and, and that was certainly one of the things that I think across all of the sites that we've identified is, is much more conversation and communication between the poverty disability world. You know, we really need to sort of expand our lens beyond, you know, what our experience or, or what we often see presented, you know, by the advocates to, to really start to expand beyond sort of some of those experiences to say, are we capturing everyone and are we, are we truly understanding what it is that they're facing or are we designing systems that by the, by the very nature of their design are inherently inaccessible because we're making judgments um, without fully understanding, you know, what, what the needs are and why those needs are there. Um, and of course, all of these services then worked with the families and the youth on SSI. And the focus again was on, on payment, that educational payment, and that financial independence. So our demographics. Um, in Maryland, we had 997 youth that were assigned to our enhanced services. 32% um, were females and 68% were males. Um, in terms of our ethnic demographics, 20% um, were white, 54% were black, 5% um, were Hispanic, and then you'll note the 5% other and 15% unreported. One of the things that we've identified that we've raised back up to the Social Security Administration is that their categories of ethnicity really didn't capture accurately um, the lived experience of our promise youth. Many of our promise youth said, I identify as biracial, and so I'm not going to pick one or the other category. Um, and so I think that that's certainly one of the lessons learned as we think about you know, how we categorize or capture demographic information. Um, I know that there are efforts in some places to, to, to expand some of the gender categories, but I think that we really need to look and start to think about do our demographic categories really reflect the lived experiences? And if not, what can we do to change them so that they do feel? Because if you're starting off immediately feeling like there isn't a box that I can check already, you know, um, we've, we've made it less engaging um, to them and, and start to create some of those barriers or those perceptions that you really don't know or understand me. So how could you possibly help me? So then um, our breakdown across the disability categories. Um, and what's most interesting to note about this is I think that there was a perception going into this that, that the, the, the core um, or the largest group were going to be individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities. And our experience in Maryland, um, in part because we went out and recruited um, from the list that Social Security provided. Um, and so we had recruiters that were out in the field going door to door. Um, you know, we did letters as well, but we really found that that um, door to door recruitment really was what helped us. But, but we, we didn't sort of 
pull from existing referral sources. Some of the other sites partnered with different, and so therefore, you know, depending on where they were getting their referrals from, you may see a different makeup of disability types. But ours really reflected our overall SSI population when you, when you step back and take a look at it. Um, it really highlighted that there are a number of youth with non-obvious disabilities um, on SSI. Um, and that presents challenges in and of itself um, because in some instances family members would say, well, don't tell them that they have a disability because they don't know. Um, or the youth would not feel comfortable with, with even self-identifying that. And, and I have to say that, you know, while we want to cultivate the sense of disability pride, I can also sort of hear them saying, but, you know, I'm already an ethnic minority and I'm in poverty, and now you want me to take on another label that might have negative stigma attached to it? So I think that we really need to think of what's in the highs, hows and the wheres, again, of how we're serving and capturing that population um, in a way that makes them feel um, a desire and willingness to engage and not one that, 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 um, that gets at some of those fears and concerns that they may have. Um, because they haven't had a chance to go through that journey um, to really start to get to that place of pride. And that, certainly those were some of the things that we tried to do through our activities with um, presentations from Ladera Corn um, and others that, that, you know, were sort of on the other side of it who could articulate, I've, I've been where you've been and I'm here now and can help instill that sense of pride. Um, I think it was also important to note, you know, when Lederick was presenting at one point in time and talking about his academic challenges, um, not only were the students sort of nodding along because his, his experience resonated with them, the parents um, in the audience were nodding. Um, and it was an aha moment for me to realize that, you know, we're, we push parents to show up for the IEP meetings and yet they may not have had a positive experience at school and so their main reaction to a uh, you know, request to come and participate in an IEP, maybe I don't want to come have you tell me that my kid is stupid while you're making me feel stupid, as opposed to seeing it as an opportunity to, to have a positive impact and to engage positively. And so it's a really reinforcement of a reminder of, you know, how can we make these things not be perceived as a negative, but, but seen as something that's a positive and that's, that's an opportunity to support you know, and to help to unleash the potential um, around some of these different pieces. Um, to also recognize that it's, it's not always the youth um, in isolation and that we need to ensure that our systems and our processes um, accommodate, you know, family members who may have English as a second language um, or may have low reading skill levels um, and so forth. And our staff spent a lot of time supporting families and completing these cumbersome um, um, application processes um, that, you know, were, were a challenge for family members um, to complete on their own without support. Um, so those were just some of the, the experiences that, uh, that uh, resonated at least with me as I turned my attention to systems change at the state level um, and also lifting up lessons learned at the federal level. Um, so again, our demographics, um, we had a really good breakdown, 55% um, urban, 45% rural. Um, what's important to note about this is we actually got higher engagement throughout the course of the program from the rural areas as opposed to the urban areas. Now the urban areas have higher populations of youth on SSI, and so when we had you know, divvied up our staff, we had anticipated that we were going to need more staff in the urban areas versus the rural areas. Um, but part of the reaction from the rural areas was this sense of, of relief um, that finally there was a support and service that was meeting them where they are. And I had, you know, reaction initially from some of my partners saying, well, you know, what's the point of engaging in this promise? You know, it's only to be for those folks. In, in Maryland, we, uh, we have the Bay Bridge and it's sort of perceived as that sort of which side of the bridge you're on and that side of the bridge if you're on the Eastern Shore gets everything and they get nothing. And so when I said, no, you know, our staff are going to be deployed across the state and we're meeting the families and youth in the communities. They're going to be a part of, they're going to be hired from your community, they're going to be out there. 
um, the the level of engagement from that that rural population was much higher, um, and and I think it was in part because they finally were able to access services that you know as a result of a variety of factors they had not able been able to, um, and in the urban areas I think sometimes there's so much competition there's so many services and they have their choice. Um, you know, that, that they can play a little harder to get. But it was really interesting to note um, the differences between urban and, and rural. Um, and I think it's also an important thing to keep in mind as we think about designing programs, um, you know, and the differences in the areas. And, and maybe we need to look at some different ways of programming for rural um, that, that, again, isn't that facility-based, but is that community-based meeting families where they are both literally and figuratively. So um, here are some of our outcomes based on our core interventions. 94% um, of our 997 um, youth um, engaged in that coordinated case management and creation of a, a family plan. Um, and again, this is a population that can be historically very hard to engage, very hard to serve. So we're, we're very proud and, and a lot of time and energy and blood and tears went into went into that, but our staff were incredibly dedicated and persistent. Um, and we developed some strategies around that engagement piece of it. We actually created supplemental um, case managers, um, and their focus was on reaching out to and engaging those youth and family members um, that dropped off the radar screen. Because if you're juggling sort of a, a caseload and you've got a bunch of uh, families and youth that are like, yes, I'll take anything you get, give me more, give me more, it becomes difficult then to say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to focus my attention on these people that aren't returning my phone calls versus those who are. Um, and so by having a supplemental case manager and when we were identifying folks that sort of were dropped off the radar screen, they were the ones, and we actually hired some of our uh, recruitment staff, um, they were the ones going out knocking on doors and that really helped with that re-engagement process. There was also a tendency early on in the process for staff to say, nah, they said that they're not interested, so can we just close them? And I said, no, you know, I, I think it's really important to frame it as, you know, respect that you don't see that there's anything that we have to offer now, but things can change. So I'm going to check back in a couple of months. Um, and by using that strategy of sort of checking back in every couple of months, we found families that, you know, and youth that weren't engaged who suddenly became engaged. And we had one family that, you know, we, we used that strategy for about five years and, you know, three months before we're ending services, they finally decide to get engaged and they're like, oh, why didn't I, you know, engage, you know, four and a half years sooner? Um, so, so I think that that's another lesson learned about sort of, you know, needs change. And so we have to think about this in the longer term and, and continually reach out to say, we're still here if you need us. Um, and I think that the fact that we did continue to reach out also established our credibility, that we weren't some fly-by-night entity and that we really were interested. We weren't going to give up on them like uh, so many of the others had. So that was a really key strategy. Then, of course, that positive personal profile I talked about, 87% of the youth completed that. Um, and I think that it's really exciting to think that 87% uh, of that 997 youth across the state um, now have a document and were forced to think about and articulate um, their strengths and what skills and so forth um, they have to offer in a workplace. Um, that's a really transformative experience that, that I, I believe that they will carry with them going forward. 87% had an individual job development plan. Um, again, those were activities that they engaged in um, to explore careers and interest areas. 81% um, had work experiences. Uh, those were unpaid, um, you know, completing applications, job shadowing, mentoring. Um, we have a, a, a data dictionary that lists, you know, what the definitions were for each of those things. But those were sort of the unpaid sort of career exploration activities. 73% engaged in paid work. And I think it's really important to note that these were individualized uh, jobs. Um, they were integrated. About a third of them were paid um, by um, employers. Um, so I think that there is an untapped potential in the resource. I don't know that we're tapping into employers and asking them about um, paid employment for youth to the degree that we could or should. Um, about a third of them were existing summer youth work programs. So Baltimore has a huge summer youth work program. So we also worked to engage them in some of the existing programs. And it's really important that, that not everything has been done under 
the umbrella of promise um, because promise was going to go away. And so by building these pathways, youth that, you know, engaged in summer work employment one year, you know, because our staff helped them to apply and they discovered, you know, the Baltimore Summer Works Program. And the next year, they knew how to do it. So they went and applied. And so some of that was helping to, to get them connected to things that would exist beyond promise. And then about a third were individuals, um, which we anticipated, individuals with more significant disabilities um, that were paid um, by promise, but that, again, were individualized um, work experiences um, to help. And a lot of those translated into actually paid employment um, uh, when the uh, promise funding ended. Um, and so that helped to translate and get that exposure and opportunity. Um, and so those were all um, the, the different pieces that we used to create those different paid work. But again, all based on the individual's interest and needs, um, using a very customized approach and identifying you know, from the employer perspective what their needs were and doing a job match. 81% engaged in benefits counseling. Um, we uh, had challenges with benefits counseling and had to change our um, a strategy or approach because one of the things that we found is that, you know, when you go through sort of the full benefits counseling, um, it requires that you provide a lot of highly personal information. Um, and this is a population that um, I think can be a little overprotective of that personal information because they've had a lot of experiences with you know, Social Security's numbers being stolen and, and so forth. Um, so it really took a lot longer to sort of build those relationships to the point that they would feel comfortable offering up that information. Um, so what we started to do then instead um, was to have individuals go out and, and proactively call and just have some conversations and provide some, some benefits, awareness, and information via conversations. Oftentimes, by having those conversations, sort of building that relationship on the front end, then it resulted in that comfort level being raised to the point that they would be more comfortable providing that information. Um, but, you know, that's, that's certainly a lesson learned. Um, and then the financial education piece, and part of why this number is lower is because, as I said, we started off with um, group-based trainings, and that really was not um, not uh, meeting the family's needs. And so uh, partway through the, the process, we added in this one-on-one -on -one financial counseling. Um, had, had we done the one-on-one -on -one financial counseling from the outset, that number probably would have been much higher. But we still feel very good about these um, outcomes, again, with a population that can often be difficult to engage and to sustain engagement across each of these because, you know, the, oftentimes we found that it also wasn't a linear experience, that we couldn't come in and say, oh, you have to do this before you can do this. You know, if paid work was what the youth was interested in, then we started with the paid work and then circled back around on sort of the unpaid work experiences that maybe aligned with their interests as a result of their paid work experience or, or just personal interests. Um, you know, but, but we did not approach um, this from a linear perspective. It was really sort of what can we get them engaged and interested in now and get that ball rolling and then circle back around on these other pieces. So um, the key features, I think I have uh, talked about uh, ad nauseum, so I will continue on. So um, our state partners. Um, the State Department of Education, um, our Department of Human Services, our Department of Juvenile Services, our Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation, our Developmental Disabilities Administration, our Behavioral Health Administration, and our Medicaid were all of the um, state partners um, that participated uh, throughout PROMISE. Um, and then our local partners, and I think that these local partnerships were really critical, and, and we had a point um, where we pulled them all together in a room um, and um, gave them the opportunity. We sort of created a framework. We had one county that had developed a really innovative tool um, that helped facilitate um, dialogue action around the youth um, doors and the schools. And what we found was that sometimes we were aware of youth that the schools or um, doors was not aware of because um, doors, at, you know, if you're on SSI, that doesn't necessarily mean that the schools know who you are. The only people who know are Social Security and then whoever, um, whether there's a social services office that helped them apply and get onto SSI. So there's a real disconnect there. But, um, but we said, you know, hey, here's this tool that, that they're using to help sort of, you know, coordinate across because what's the point in us duplicating services? Let's ensure that our services or the supports or the transition planning are all sort of forming a cohesive whole. So we held that up as a model. 
Um, but then we said, you know, this is one model, but you guys think about how you'd like to approach it, you know, with the doors people, the school people, and our promise staff. Um, and it was interesting by sort of creating a construct of here's some models and here are some expectations, but we're going to let you decide what's going to work in your local area. We got far more partnership engagement, even though everyone was slightly different, than I think we would have if we'd attempted to dictate it. And that certainly is a lesson learned when we're thinking about collaboration and so forth is sort of, you know, the fact that, that each locale is different. Um, and some of them had different structures that they could build off of. Some of them needed to create new structures and so forth. Um, but the end result was to the benefit of everyone. And we're using this as a model for a number of other interagency coordination and collaboration activities um, at the local level as a lesson learned. Um, our uh, disability determination and support service offices, um, the America's Job Centers, and then other community services and resources. And again, um, when our staff started, because we were in the recruitment at the same time we were bringing on staff, um, you know, if they didn't have a caseload yet, one of the things that they were charged with were identifying resources in the unity. Um, one of our lessons learned is, in fact, in the poverty world, um, through the social service offices, um, one of our regions you know, um, has staff that have worked there for many years and, and are just now starting to sort of think about their disability lens. And they're discovering resources, and they prided themselves on knowing everything that was available in their community. And they're discovering disability-specific resources that they were not aware of. Um, and so again, it really highlights that need for more engagement and partnership between the poverty and disability community because I think the perception is always oh, the disability community is over there and, and so we're going to send over there. But for a variety of reasons, these families and youth don't make it over there. So we need to figure out how to infuse you know, what we know and, and what can support where they are. Um, and I, I know across all of the sites, meeting families and youth where they are was a consistent theme across all of the aspects of promise and, and part of what made it successful. Um, we have to stop expecting that people will come to us or that if we refer them on that they will make it there. We have to proactively go out and engage them and find them and, and serve them where they are. Okay. So our promise work strategies. Um, one of the things that we found is that we really needed to create some, some, some tools to measure because, again, our staff were all out in the community, so they're not down the hallway. So you would always know what they're doing. Um, and you also don't always know that, they, that while they may be working very hard, they're not necessarily investing their time in the activities that are going to be most likely to help get to the outcomes that we, you know, had committed to the U.S. Department of Education and the researchers that we would get. Um, so we really found a need to start to develop some tools. Um, and it really helped to direct their activities. It also helped balance and to not get consumed by, by the crises. They, not that they didn't continue to meet the crises, but they didn't lose sight of the balance of, of you know, the longer term outcomes that we were trying to achieve. And, and we also so try to help make the link. But if you're if you're focused on some of these longer term pieces like work, then that's going to minimize some of these other crises. Um, so for our employment specialists, um, we set some numeric targets, um, and one of them was 10 employer contacts per per week. Um, particularly early on, when they didn't have um, a huge caseload or the caseload um, during the school year, the the, the students were not. Um, as available to work, you know, um, building those employer contacts and that relationship and having a pool to draw from was really critical. So we had to create those targets. And some of these lessons learned are, I think, things that could be applied as we talk about changes to home and community-based waivers um, and that community and employment first and so forth, um, and as we're, we're thinking about moving away from shelter workshops um, and having staff and certain individuals out in the community, um, I think performance measure outcomes targets are going to be, um, you know, and a, and a data management system um, that's tracking all of this is going to be really key um, to, to not losing sight of the outcomes um, and uh, the desires um, that are being driven by the youth um, or, or the individuals with disabilities and needs as it relates to work. 
Um, and then monitoring of the job development activities. Again, that technical assistance to the support staffing use and that modeling in the field space. Um, because it was a research grant, um, we really needed to focus on fidelity. We needed to ensure that the intervention was being delivered equitably, uh, qualitatively, um, consistently across, across the site. So all of the youth were getting similar experiences. Um, but it, it makes me wonder, even though this you know, was a research grant, that fidelity piece is important. Why isn't fidelity important, you know, in any of our service delivery? You know, we talk about the safety and the quality assurance pieces and so forth, you know, maybe we need to start to think about what are the, some, some of the pieces or components, you know, that we know are likely to, to get us to the desired outcome of, you know, paid work in the community and so forth and start to be building those in. And again, to ensure that consistency of delivery of service and quality, um, you know, for the individuals across, you know, across the state or across an organization. Um, that partnership with school and the DOORS personnel that I talked about, that was a really key piece. Um, as well as these tools, the, the asset-based youth profile, which we call the positive personal uh, profile and job uh, development plan. So um, our successes, um, so drilling down a little bit more on the paid and unpaid work experiences because Maryland really, really focused on that employment piece. Um, all of the other interventions were important, but, you know, work um, was really, you know, um, the thing that, that we were constantly having to push our staff to focus on. Um, so at least one um, work experience, paid or unpaid, 82% um, um, achieved that. Um, and. Um, 81% had at least one unpaid work experience. And our goal was that, you know, youth would have at least one unpaid and one paid work experience. What we found was that in some instances, we were able to go back and to have multiple unpaid work experiences and multiple paid experiences. Um, and oftentimes with the promise funded experiences, we'd say, you know, promise will pay for one. Um, the next one, you know, needs to be employer paid or needs to be an existing youth. And we had, you know, um, and we saw growth as a result of that and that those experiences sort of built on, on one another. Um, so um, that was important. Um, and 42%, um, so almost half had more than one unpaid work experience. 73% um, had at least one paid work experience. 72% had at least one unpaid and one paid. Um, and 71% uh, had more than one paid work experience, um, which I think is really critical. And uh, one of our frontline staff told a story about um, how um, the youth that she was serving um, had had a very positive paid experience. Um, uh, that was promised paid and uh, wanted to go back to work at, at the place that they had had that experience. And she said, well, you know, you know what the process is, so you can go get an application now and you can complete it. And he got really mad at her. Um, but she held firm um, and he completed the application and got the job. And, you know, and, and she said, look, I wasn't trying to be mean, but I also wanted to help you to be, and he felt so good about the fact that he did it, even though he was mad at her, like the fact that she forced him to, and he did it by himself, and he got it by himself. And I think that that's an experience that really resonates, and that's that, that how do we provide that support and then start to, to scale back and, and to help them to believe in their own abilities, because that's what they're going to carry forward. If all we've done is create a dependency and we're going to go away, um, you know, that's ultimately not going to be changing the outcome for them, and, and that's a, a perfect example. Um, and I will say, as, as a staff person, that was a hard thing to do. Um, so she felt really good when, when the outcome was such a positive one, and she saw the impact and the benefit, because her first instinct would have been like, sure, I'll help you, um, you know, but, but she saw the fact that, that by stepping back, they, they really could step up and do it on their own, and that's exciting. Okay. So um, benefits counseling, you know, um, really having youth learn early, often, that they're always better off working. Um, and this was really critical because many of these youth um, have to undergo an SSI redetermination at age 18. And many of them are not going to be found eligible um, based on the adult criteria. Um, and that becomes a real game changer. And, and I'm not certain that the population really understands the difference between adult SSI and youth SSI, um, because in their world it's just SSI. 
um, you know, and that, you know, and so I think that that 818 redetermination sometimes uh, catch, catches them off guard. Um, but it also is an opportunity um, if they're eligible for VR services um, and they, they engage in and have a, a plan for employment. And I don't know how this is going to change as a result of, of pre-employment transition services. But, um, you know, if at age 18 they have an IPE, then they can be eligible for something called Section 301. And Section 301 allows individuals to continue to receive that monthly benefit while they're actively engaged in that plan for employment. Um, and, and I would like to see some modifications and changes and, and expansion of that, um, particularly um, given some of the capacity issues uh, as a result with, within vocational rehabilitation um, that have been changing. Um, you know, but that, um, you know, maybe America's job centers and so forth could be places that that opportunity could be made available as well. Um, because I think uh, being able to continue to have that check come in while they get that very few kids at age 18 are really ready to be able to access an, a, a job that's going to pay a living wage. But I think that incentive being able to retain that check while they're engaged in, in post-school training and employment is, is certainly something worthy of further um, discussion and consideration. Um, and then um, SSI keeps these families trapped in poverty. Um, you know, so, so, but they don't always understand that. And so communicating to them that it's okay if you participate in your IEP. It's okay if you go to doors. It's okay to engage in pre-employment transition services because that's going to have no bearing on your um, eligibility determination at age 18 um, for, for, you know, for adults. Um, and so we want to make certain that they understand the importance and value of access services um, and doing that at that exploration based on what's available. Um, and, you know, also to help them to understand that benefits will not automatically be lost um, when they begin working, that there are a number of different work incentives and things that can be put in place because I think the perception is, oh, if I go to work immediately, everything stops and I'm on my own and, and that's not the case, but we need to figure out ways to message that in a way that really resonates with, with this population. So the challenges. Um, so, you know, it's easy to say, you know, oh, here are all the great things that we've done, but there were a number of challenges throughout this and learning experiences. Um, and so we had um, a number of uh, challenges that I wanted to highlight um, to share sort of what our, our strategies or changes were, um, one of which is that engagement in promise services. And I talked about the specialized case managers and streamlining the paperwork. Um, we, you know, our intake process, um, because Waystation had an intake process, we had the family plan, and we really needed to figure out how on the front end we could minimize the amount of paperwork and how we could capture this information in a, in a way and, and move to progress or engagement around you know, the family plan activities because that became a real barrier. Um, so we really had to, to take a look at all of the paperwork that we were using for that intake process and figure out how to minimize it or how to be strategic. You know, if we're capturing the same information in three different places, how can we just capture it one time and have it, have it be translated across all of the different documents and so forth? So I think that those are some important pieces. You know, do our application processes or our starting points have to be 10 pages long or could we start with two pages and then build on them? Because again, they should be living, breathing documents that evolve and change over time. Um, that linkages to adult services. Um, this is certainly one significant area um, that, that has emerged. Um, I think that the, the perception of what schools are required to do and or can do um, as it relates to transition and connectivity to um, adult um, services and um, is very different from the reality. Um, so schools, um, schools are required under IDEA as part of the transition plan to provide information. Um, so they can sit in a meeting with family members and say, you know, here's information on doors. Um, they, um, they can't share that information with um, the adult service agencies without consent. Um, and that's certainly one of the pieces that we're continuing to work on here in Maryland is how do you make the case and help parents to understand the value of giving that consent. Um, so that consent piece is the first thing. 
Um, and then, you know, they're required to provide information, but they don't have the staffing or the resources, nor are they required to help people complete those applications. And that certainly was a role that our Promise staff played um, and, and is an existing gap for folks that need that assistance. Now, there are some school personnel who will go above and beyond and do that, but that, that's not a requirement, that's not an expectation, um, and oftentimes, you know, depending on their leadership or administration, you know, they may not be allowed to, to do that, or they're, they're doing it on the side in their spare time. Um, but that's certainly something that I think is important enough that from a systemic perspective, we need to figure out and ensure that there's funds and resources available for someone to be able to do that, that, that piece of it um, in a dedicated way. Um, and then, you know, when you have that, how does that information get conveyed? So I think I talked previously about um, this paper tool that um, Carroll County developed. Um, and uh, we, it, it works so well that we are um, exploring in Maryland um, and actually have, have developed a pilot of creating an online tool. Um, and right now it's just being piloted with two local schools and, um, and the Division of Rehabilitation Services. Um, but it's a place where the schools can upload the consent. Um, so right up front, everyone knows that they have consent to share information. Um, you know, and then the information is in there um, around sort of what pre-employment services they're getting from, from DOORS. So it, it, it allows us to pull from the DOORS AWARE database to populate that, which helps inform the schools because the schools oftentimes don't even know when a youth is engaged with DOORS. Um, and then it also helps, you know, in terms of that anticipated services. So now that youth, you know, because that consent is there is known, um, two doors. Um, we hope to expand it to our developmental disabilities, um, to our America's job centers, um, because that's a, a key referral source. Um, and to help build that out as a means of, of having some of that connectivity. Um, it's not going to replace that, that local coordination collaboration, um, but our school reaction um, with the pilot is, you know, yes, ultimately this, this means of information is going to be really helpful um, in, in really improving the quality of not only to the transition services, but from the school's perspective, um, capturing indicator 14, one year out from school, where are those youth and so forth. Um, so we're very excited about it still. Is, it still is in its early infancies, but, um, but the uh, initial pilot um, efforts have been really positive, and one school site has done a fantastic job of getting consent from all of the, um, the parents and uh, we're looking to develop um, a fact sheet about that because that consent piece really makes or breaks what schools can and can't share um, with adult service partners and that becomes a real gap as part of that transition process. If all they can do is provide information and they have no way of knowing did the family follow up, um, were they found eligible? If I referred them to doors, so they put on a wait list, so maybe I need to circle back around and get them connected to the America's Job Centers. Um, so we're very excited about that, um, that as a potential tool. Um, that staff capacity regarding employment services. Again, our staff came from a wide array of backgrounds. Some came from education. Some had, you know, um, social work backgrounds. Some came from corrections, um, juvenile justice. Um, education across the gamut. Um, and so we really needed to, to build a consistent capacity um, across all of them. And so that intensive field-based technical assistance and training, and to also to help them to understand all of the different partners that are out there. Um, you know, I think so much of our disability services and our functions are, are, you know, I work with this population and I understand this funding stream. Uh, and we really had to create individuals that understood and could work across a wide array of the different partners and to know when, you know, they needed to be connected to mental health services and that was to the core service provider, you know, versus, you know, developmental disability administration or any of the other um, different uh, funders and resources that were out there. And then that community oversight and supervision. Again, we had to build performance management tools and data reports that really helped us to keep apprised of what was happening on the front line, when were barriers being countered, because sometimes, you know, staff would hit a barrier and they wouldn't know what to do and, and it wasn't always being lifted up. And so, you know, the data started to tell us, wow, you know, you, you seem to be spinning your wheels here. Can we hear and talk through um, and, you know, and, and come up with some strategy and being able to identify and lift up 
you know, when they were stuck um, and pull in, you know, leadership and others to help problem solve, um, really help keep that forward momentum going and really help to ensure that we're getting the outcomes and the numbers um, in, a, in a quality way, um, but that we were on track to meet what we had committed to, um, to having happen under this. So our continuous quality improvement, um, again, constantly having to look at what we were doing, how we were doing it, what was working, what was not, and what are the pieces. So that, that data-informed and data-driven, um, we had what we called a fidelity report um, that had elements of, of the, the port interventions and what were the, the things that needed to happen that then would result in that outcome. You know, um, were the you know pieces or the steps along the way um, being completed? Because we knew if, if they weren't being completed, then then we were never going to get to the outcome. So that fidelity work, worked on that. Then we also looked at that individual weekly action tracker. Um, again, really critical when you're supervising staff out in the field. Um, so what are their priorities for the coming week? Did they accomplish them? If not, why? Um, this helped um, in terms of sort of identifying staff that maybe weren't performing that needed to be moved on, um, but also the really good staff who were getting stuck and, and needed some help you know, from above to be able to help either remove the barriers or to help strategize or problem solve some different ways. Um, and so that weekly tracker really helped with that supervision and ensuring that forward momentum and, and helped. Um, and also identified tech, you know, wow, you seem to be really struggling consistently with this particular intervention. Let's get you some technical assistance or support as you're going out in the field, um, you know, and model and so forth um, to really help with that. Then our performance matrix, and that's where we captured all of the key points that we were um, committed to providing to the U.S. Department of Education and helped us to really monitor progress on that. And when things weren't moving and were getting stuck, then we knew that we had to, to from a leadership perspective, go back in, figure out what was going on and come up with um, some strategies or systems changes that would um, help that forward progress. Um, and again, that intensive field-based TA. So, you know, our lessons learned and implications. We need to expand the principle that all individuals can work with the right support to the social services world and beyond. Um, so within the disability world, at least in Maryland, we've made really good headway. So I think that messaging around employment first. However, there, the stereotypes or the expectations um, still exist external to the disability world, and we need to start to really infuse that, particularly in social services where that's often the entry point to the disability, the SSI um, benefits and so forth, and that messaging as they're coming in um, really needs to be, you know, you're coming in and onto SSI not only because you're in poverty and you have a disability, but also because this is going to allow you to access the supports and services you need um, to be able to access work. Um, and so I think that we really, you know, nationally, and we're, we're engaging in some dialogues um, around poverty and, and disability and, and how we can help those two worlds. You know, when we sat down with leaders from other states, um, they, they weren't even aware that such thing as benefits counseling existed and that there were resources such as WIPA. So it really highlights that we need to start talking beyond our traditional disability partners um, to get this message and this information out. We need to import, uh, promote the importance and value of participation in IEPs to family and social services staff. Um, families and kids in foster care, um, guardians, social service staff, um, whoever it is that, that are the folks um, that are supporting them, they absolutely, if, if the youth has an IEP, and not all the youth on um, SSI have IEPs, um, that's certainly a lesson learned, um, but if they have an IEP, you know, those staff should be, you know, required to you know, to ensure that that youth and family participate on an annual basis, um, A, because it's going to help their education outcomes, and B, um, in Maryland, when they get to the age of 14, 16, and other places, it means that that transition planning will occur, and they'll start to hear about all of the resources, like pre-employment transition services and other things that are there, and so it's really going to help facilitate 
what they're trying to do, you know, um, it, which is the same thing we are, you know, help kids grow up to be, you know, um, independent, productive adults. And so um, really starting to think about how can we start to measure and ensure that, you know, that that, that is happening um, because we, we saw that big disconnect. Um, and then we need to expand that policy work to include a focus on those not eligible for vocational rehabilitation, particularly those with non-obvious disabilities and poverty. So, you know, um, Maryland has historically been under order of selection since the 1990s. Um, and so there are individuals with disabilities who are not going to receive vocational rehabilitation services. Um, other states have also been under order of selection, um, and that number is increasing, um, particularly as a result of the pre-employment transition services. Um, so I believe that 32 states now are under order of selection, um, and um, uh, 11 um, may have uh, stopped taking any any um, when off of the, uh, the categories for adult services. Um, and what that means is that, you know, the youth who maybe don't have, you know, as obvious, maybe they have learning disabilities or attention deficit disorder, the ones that don't necessarily rise to the level, um, but coupled with the fact that they're um, in poverty um, or maybe some, some behavioral health issues that, again, don't rise to, to the, the higher levels of category, are not getting, um, are not eligible for any adult service on the basis of disability. One of the things that we did as part of that um, exit plan because as we closed out all of our youth when we ended the enhanced intervention, um, we had a, a checklist, you know, did they complete all the interventions and, and various things that needed to occur. One of which was they either need to be connected to the Division of Rehabilitation Services and found eligible or to the America's Job Centers. Um, and we really need to expand the capacity of the America's Job Centers. I know that on paper, WIOA says they're to, to be serving 75% out of school youth and the disadvantaged population, but I don't think the capacity is there yet. Um, but we really need to build that as an alternative so that every kid exits um, with a place to be connected to. If they're not going to college, if they're not going to the military, if they're not, um, you know, walking out the door into a job, you know, then Division of Rehabilitation Services, you know, America center, whatever it is, that there is something that exists when they walk um, across the stage and out the door. Okay. Engagement. Engagement can be successful with intensive strategic outreach. Um, this population is highly transient, a lot of movement and so forth. Text messages really um, were the most effective way, um, in part because they oftentimes minutes, but sometimes one of the things you need to have in your toolkit is something that allows them to, to add minutes so they can talk on the phone. Um, but text messages really seem to be an effective strategy. Um, and also being a presence in the community. When Maryland experienced um, the uh, riots, um, our promise staff were out in the field because that's where they always are. And we, we did pull them back from the field. We had one recruiter who, bless his heart, said, you know, I just drove past a burning car, so I think today I'm going to go home and make phone calls. Um, but that's how dedicated our staff were. And even though we, we didn't want them out in the streets um, because we wanted to ensure their safety, they were sitting in their homes, and some of them lived in these communities, identifying the resources, where their students could go and access free lunch because schools were closed and many of them relied on that. You know, where were the places that, that they could, that the youth and the families could access in their communities because um, their resources were not available. Um, and I think that that level of engagement and commitment and that presence um, really made a difference. Um, to the families and youth and really saw that we were invested and then we weren't just dropping and then going home to our comfortable homes at night. Um, and that was really important. Uh, that employment capacity is lacking in the broader system. Um, again, you know, when we think about poverty and all of these other pieces, you know, we need to figure out how to build out some of these other pieces so that, it, so that it, the onus can't all be on the disability world. How are we doing universal design so that, that you know, we're not saying, oh, you have to come in through the disability door, um, you know, but how can we meet you where you are? Um, and how can we infuse some of the lessons learned, like customized employment? I mean, we, the disability community has developed fantastic practices that, that, that would 
serve anyone with an area to employment, English as a second language, you know, um, any of these things. And, and I think that we need to do a better job of pushing these models out as strategies um, that just become part of the, the broader fabric of our um, employment and workforce development system. Um, our staff wages don't align with the skills needed. We certainly were able to pay more for our staff um, under promise. Um, and that certainly made a difference, but there still is a huge disconnect between the skills that are really required um, and, and, and the wages that they pay. Um, and, and that's certainly something that we can't lose sight of. Another important lesson learned, um, and this is something that I think is being experienced nationally as we look across um, the broad framework, is the, um, is the fact that, um, that serving youth is different from adults. And so, you know, we can't just turn around and have been serving adults and expect that we can just say, okay, well, we'll just start doing this to youth. Um, they require different things to be engaged, what they're looking for, their desires, and so forth, and we really need to be mindful of and start to develop different strategies. I know that um, there's a benefits counseling um, curriculum that uh, California is piloting for, um, for youth, um, and we really need to be mindful of the fact that youth and adults have different needs, different interests, and, and to be designing programs and services, particularly under Priet, um, that, that focus on those. Um, I think I've touched on some of these. Um, knowledge of trauma-informed care and motivational interviewing are critical. Um, those were skills that had to be, be poverty, being in poverty um, is, is, is a trauma in and of itself. Um, and so that motivational interviewing, trauma-informed care were all aspects that across all of the promise sites were skills that our frontline staff needed. Um, so I would certainly encourage you, if you're working with this population or, or any similar population, if you have it, to look at developing that skill in your frontline workforce. Um, and again, these, many of these youth with non-obvious disabilities, with or without IEPs, are unwilling to self-identify as having a disability. But I'm not certain that we should make you know, eligibility for services or being able to meet their needs predicated on that that willingness to, to identify um, what can we build into where they are or where they're comfortable going that help put them on this path. Um, systems changing. Um, all community-based, how to supervise staff in the field, what gets measured gets done. We have a series of webinars through the University of Maryland that talk about these different things. So um, I think on the final screen there is a connection where you can find that information. The post-schools connection, um, I talked about uh, this MSDE, University of Maryland tracker, tracker that is being developed, and we certainly, as, as we build and expand upon that, we'll be um, sharing that um, more broadly. We're, we're still in its infancy here in the state, but we're very excited about that. Um, I've talked about what we're doing um, in Allegheny County, um, which is aligning promise um, with 2Gen. 2Gen is a poverty-based strategy that's multiple, um, that's hitting families and youth, um, and the correlation is almost uncanny. Um, so we're working to try and align that so that maybe some of these promise activities and, and lessons learned can be informed through the 2Gen work that's going forward. Um, Parents Place. We've also partnered with Parents Place because our parent training center was really not at a place that they could meet the needs of our families and youth. Um, and so one of the things that we've been doing is some systems change and capacity building with them um, so that they can start to engage in outreach with um, families in poverty, um, and particularly youth with non-obvious disabilities, um, and, and how we can make the information that we provide less academic, less overwhelming to families. Um, and so our parents' place has been a really great partner in this, um, and so, um, so we're really excited about some of the things that, that they're changing about how they approach it um, to, to, to ensure that they're serving um, a broader array of family needs across the state. Um, and then our gaps. We need increased access and availability of work incentives and how to refine it to better meet the needs of the population. Um, I've touched on a couple of these other things. We need much more financial education and ABLE. We actually linked um, a lot of our youth and a number of our promise sites to ABLE accounts. Um, and so marketing ABLE, um, particularly to this population, I think is a really key piece. We need increased assertive community services and staff in the field. Um, I talked a little bit about the funding gaps and rotation was one of the other ones that was a huge, huge piece that, that Promise had to fund because that, that's an ongoing issue. Um, and I've talked about consent. 
And so there's where you can go for more information, um, how to contact me, and also um, where you can go to the University of Maryland Center um, that has a number of these webinars as well as um, research briefs and, and other resources. And then our mdtransitions.org um, was our promised website that we are transitioning into um, a transition youth website to meet the needs of all um, youth and uh, parents in Maryland. Um, so there's a number of resources and information there that may be of interest. So thank you all for your time and attention. Wow, okay. <laughs> That was, as I promised, a very thorough, very comprehensive look at the Promise program. And um, I know I have a million questions. I know we have a couple of, uh, we have at least one question in the chat box. So I want to defer to our wonderful audience members first. Um, but before we do that, um, operator, can you quickly explain how somebody can ask a question, either by phone or by the chat box? Thank you, Philip. Yes, of course. Um, if um, hi everyone, if you are dialed in and have questions. You can press seven pound. Again, that's seven pound on your touch tone phone. Open the line according to the order received. Please wait for the prompt saying your line has been unmuted and ask your question. You may also send your question using the Q&A window located on the lower left side of the presentation screen. All you have to do is just type your question and then press uh, ask with your mouse to submit. Questions submitted are private and can only be seen by moderators. Thank you. Gotcha. Um, so the first two questions, um, so one, um, one's for me, one's for you, Jade. So I'll go with the Jade question first. It was uh, Lynn Kill Nibble Link, I hope I said that right, was talking about um, kudos to Maryland for reducing the paperwork, especially across the partner agencies. And so that's, you know, one quick, you know, I'm going to turn that into a quick question to say is, you know, you talked about some reluctance from the school districts to get involved with the program from the very beginning. So what do you think really kind of was the biggest motivation to get all the partners together in the room um, to make this, pro pro make this program a success? Well, so we had a lot of support from our State Department of Special Education. And so communicating that down to the local. Um, and I also think that oftentimes what happens is, you know, there's a a lot of people between sort of the top and the bottom. Um, and the folks that were at the bottom absolutely were like, oh my gosh, yes, like we want you to be able to help, you know, the Promise Youth because, you know, we could we could pay for summer school. We could do things that, that help support their outcomes. And sometimes the folks in the middle are sort of, you know, worried about the legalese and so forth. And, and we certainly accounted for all of that. But the fact that we didn't have to go through 26 different school agents you know, um, local education authorities um, for consent, um, but instead the fact that we were at the table because parents had given us consent to be at the table, I think um, really helped minimize the, the concern and stress of what their liability was. We were coming to the table with, with a written document that had that consent um, that, that allowed for that. And the frontline staff, you know, were like, great, you know, because all we were doing was showing up to be able to help and support what they were they were doing, um, you know, so so it was it was not it they became they began to see the value of it because you know it wasn't a huge investment in on in time on their end and they saw the benefits um, you know and so forth um, so so that that I think really made the difference. Got it. Um, and then Helen Drody had a question for me um, uh, is you know will the slides be available um, and. So what we always, what Respectability always does with our webinars is we always post a video and audio recording of um, the webinars that we presented on our website. So just Google Respectability webinars. Um, and Jade, you shared the slides with me. Is it okay if I send them out to everybody who registered to attend today? Absolutely. Wonderful. So yeah, Helen, um, the slides will be going out either by email or will be posted on Respectability's website um, very soon. So um, Jade, I have a different question, um, and really I'm interested in that um, family engagement was such an important part of the work you're doing with the youth, um, and I'm really curious, you know, how do you see that evolving as um, kind of informing the practices of, say, voc rehab or um, workforce programs moving forward? So I, I'm not certain that that's something that can evolve within our existing structures. Um, but I do know that Wisconsin is looking at um, is there a mechanism under, because all of these families are on Medicaid, if there's a mechanism under that. 
Um, I know that there's discussion of a Promise 2.0. Um, we're also looking at some additional research opportunities that, again, would focus on that family component piece so that we can continue to build evidence that that family engagement piece makes a difference. And that's where that two-gen piece, which is really a poverty world piece, um, is a really critical place to sort of get at the table because there, it's two generations. So it's, it, they're, they're using that strategy in their world, you know, dealing with individuals and families in poverty, saying, you know, we need to address both the families and the youth. And so I think you know, being able to align um, some of the activities and inform um, that process um, could have some real validity as well. So we're continuing to, to look for ways um, to figure out how that piece can be. But that IEP piece um, is certainly one of the places, you know, the very first thing we have to do is to get families to show up for the IEPs, um, you know, because that's, that, that drives pretty much everything when they're in school. Um, you know, and that also allows us the place to set the 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 expectation of uh, work as an outcome. You know, if families if families showed up for every IEP starting from the time that their kid is identified, typically around fourth grade, but maybe earlier, um, or even in the early intervention services and so forth, and we're constantly sending that message of work. Um, you know, that family engagement piece is really really key um, early on in, in setting those expectations and, and showing them, you know, what's possible and just setting it up front as, hey, your, your son or daughter can go to work. This is an outcome we're going to be working towards over the course of their academic career so that they exit with that as an expectation and we're connecting them to the services to make it a reality. Gotcha. Um, so I'm going to waive the moderator's right to ask the last question. So I'm um, really curious. Um, you mentioned HCBS, and that's not um, obviously you know, working in disability for the last few years. I'm familiar with you know, HCBS generally, but I'm curious to see you know, where do you see um, that fitting in, into HCBS, the HCBS role, the services and supports that are provided through those streams interfacing with kind of the goal to get more and more youth with disabilities into workforce. Well, so the, the home and community-based waivers are, um, you know, fund basically the long-term supports for, for individuals. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes they come out to, of school um, and um, in some instances they, they haven't always gone to work, gone through the Division of Rehabilitation Services. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work around employment first and really making that sort of more of a, uh, you know, um, coming out and into a community-based setting versus a facility-based setting, that individualized, meaningful day, um, you know, that and moving away from that congregate setting. And, and to me, employment is the greatest way to achieve um, inclusion and integration because, you know, the bulk of their peers are working um, in the community um, without disabilities. So, um, so those pieces, um, I think that there's lessons learned around that sort of performance management piece. Um, but all of this, I think, is, is coalescing. It's interesting to see. I think that the feds, um, if you start to look across, to, you know, WIOA and those changes, the home and community-based waiver changes, um, they're starting to be more consistency. It doesn't completely align, but they're making progress um, around the sort of value of competitive integrated work um, spending your time in integrated settings, you know, that family engagement piece, particularly when you talk about individuals in, in home and community-based waivers, you know, the number one thing that we heard loud and clear when we first discarded, started discussing employment first was families saying, you know, but, but how will my son or daughter work? And a lot of fear and concern, and we actually developed under a separate um, grant a, 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 a video called Why Not Work? And it was parents who had gone through that sort of trajectory of those fears and the issues and concerns um, and who were able to articulate what those fears and concerns were and why they're glad that they overcame them and what the outcome was and the benefit of their son or daughter working or being in the community and that dignity of risk. And I think that, that you know, all of these expectations, fears, you know, I think if you're, if you're a parent, um, it doesn't matter the degree of severity of, of disability and whether or not they're going to be eligible for long-term support. Your fears and concerns are, are for the safety. Um, you know, and, and what are you risking and, and will they be taken care of 
for the rest of their lives and so forth. And so I think that there's real consistency when you look across sort of federal policy, the arrows that, that we're moving in. Um, and, you know, regardless of disability, that are, that are things that we need to think about and address. You know, how do we create this message that everyone understands, everyone can work with the right supports and services? Got it. Perfect. Well, and with that um, very clear and very positive note, um, we're going to wrap up today's webinar. I would very quickly like to let folks know about our next scheduled webinar, which is on Wednesday, July 31st at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, and so that's actually just going to be a webinar presented by some of the respectability staff. And so we're really going to be talking about um, some of our key ideas uh, around you know, how to link efforts to fight stigmas, advance opportunities, and support young leaders with disabilities to succeed. Um, so we recently gave a, a very important presentation to a um, federal interagency working group around disability employment. And so we've repurposed that PowerPoint deck to really talk about, well, here's kind of the core strategies that respectability uses to you know, support and empower working age Americans with disabilities across the country. And really this upcoming webinar on Wednesday, July 31st at 1.30 p.m. Eastern is going to be a chance for us to say, all right, well, here's how you can take our ideas and Put them to practice um, at your local level in your community, and I think it's going to be a great chance to get some new conversation going on how to do all this critically important work. So, um, thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, Luke, our operator. Um, that's it for today's webinar. I appreciate your time, your attention, and your interest. Um, digital copies of the slides and the recording will be available soon. Once again, thank you very much, and have a fabulous day. <laughs>